Two big things happened this week that most people don't understand, but it's potentially devastating to the United States and globalists like Klaus Schwab. The World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab believe in no nations, no borders. They don't believe in sovereignty. The Biden administration doesn't believe in borders either. This week, we saw a record number of military-aged illegal immigrants pouring across the U.S. southern border. You can see the situation here in Lukeville behind us. We got well over 800 people waiting in line here after they crossed illegally overnight, waiting to be apprehended by Border Patrol. Once again, it's like deja vu from yesterday. You can see these guys are coming in from all over the world, a lot of African men, mostly single. Well, Russia, China, and Iran have other views of the world. They believe in sovereign power, they believe in borders, and they have other plans. And this week we saw how these two worldviews are sort of crashing into one another. We'll have more on that part in a moment. But first, some context, very important context to understand here. In July of 1944, just a few weeks after D-Day, when it was clear that the Nazis would fall and the West would win the war, 730 people from 44 allied nations flew into the United States and they met at the amazing Bretton Woods Resort in New Hampshire. It was known as the Bretton Woods Conference. If you've ever been here, you know how stunning it is. And you can just imagine all of these leaders coming together to talk about the future of your money. Think about this for a moment. The war wouldn't even end for another year, but here they were already putting together a framework to run the world in the future. At the conference, they created, among other things, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the world's new bank. And yes, most of the talk, of course, was around gold and making sure that allied governments used gold standards for their currencies. But they also established a robust supply chain system, which is what I want to focus on today. Now, that supply chain system would be run by the best navy in the world, the U.S. Navy. The U.S. would protect the waters so that countries could trade freely. Ships could go through the Suez Canal, the Straits of Hormuz, the Panama Canal, the South China Sea. The United States Navy would run the show and protect them. You just have to pay us 2%, 2% of your GDP, and use the United States dollar to make your transactions. Well, there's two big problems with that. Here's one of them that Donald Trump called out to their faces back in 2018. Watch this. I have been very, very direct with Secretary Stoltenberg and members of the alliance in saying that NATO members must finally contribute their fair share and meet their financial obligations. But 23 of the 28 member nations are still not paying what they should be paying and what they are supposed to be paying for their defense. Yeah, notice all of their faces, how uncomfortable to be called out for not paying their bill. Yeah, we can't afford, really, to carry the burden any longer. You don't pay, we can't keep this arrangement going. We can only protect you for so long. The U.S. Navy can't do it anymore. We're spread too thinly. And guess what? Second, this arrangement only works if other world powers don't rise up and challenge the U.S. Navy. It relies on these other countries basically being weak. Well, that ship has now sailed. <laughs> The Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen had already hijacked one commercial vessel in the Red Sea, and now they have attacked three more, hitting them with anti-ship missiles. This week, Yemen began to flex its muscles and political clout. Yemen is backed by Iran, and they began launching attacks against commercial ships in the Red Sea, launching attacks against U.S. and British warships and commercial interests. The United States knows that it's in trouble because if we hit Yemen's military infrastructure, Yemen could hit Saudi Arabia's oil manufacturing and shut down millions of barrels of oil, which would be devastating to the United States and to the West. Even the Biden administration realized it, and they can't hit back. They're sort of stuck sitting on their hands right now. So the United States just has to sit there and take it like a punching bag. That means Yemen can continue to target and control the waters off its coast, driving up the cost of shipping. And now these companies will have to raise prices 20% just to cover the cost of armed protection for their shipments going through these areas. But Yemen and Iran aren't alone. Now China began stepping up its attacks against the Philippine ships in the South China Sea this week. The Philippines has accused China of obstructing three of its warships using water cannons in the South China Sea. The sea is at the centre of a border dispute between China, the Philippines and several other countries. 
Chinese ships can be seen in video footage firing strong water blasts towards Philippine government vessels. Wait a second, the South China Sea? The United States has military bases all over this area. The U.S. Navy controls these waters, essentially, as they often tell us they do. But I guess we can't ensure their safety anymore either. Russia is setting up total control of the new Arctic trade route that would cut shipping times down by 75%. So we can't go through the icy Arctic anymore, and we're getting attacked in the Red Sea near Iran and near China. The globalist supply chains of the West are being attacked. The old Bretton Woods system is crumbling. And the United States is very vulnerable thanks to President Obama shutting down mining and drilling in the United States. Of course, this follows in the footsteps of Bill Clinton outsourcing our uranium mining to Russia. So we outsourced it to all of these other countries because environmentalists were worried about drilling on United States lands and waters. So now we have no uranium, very little gold mining, very little lithium mining, very little cobalt mining, very little nickel mining. We've shut down oil drilling. Biden just blocked oil drilling in Alaska, even though the people of Alaska have been asking for it, for jobs and for infrastructure and for economic growth. Never mind what the Alaskan people want. Blocked, banned. This is devastating to the United States. With these supply chains now unable to be protected by the U.S. Navy, the Bretton Woods system collapsing, larger superpowers like China, Russia, and Iran on the rise doing their own drilling in their own backyard, we desperately need to ramp up domestic production or we are going to be screwed. We need to bring these mineral productions home to the United States. Now, if re-elected, Trump just announced on day one that he would start drilling again. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. We're closing the border and we're drilling, drilling, drilling. After that, I'm not a dictator. So that, okay. that, that's a but that's years away. By the time he actually implements it, we could be looking at years until that happens. And by the way, if Democrats would even allow it, there's probably more indictments coming and their hope is that he will be thrown in prison. Thankfully, though, there is Canada which is emerging as a safe alternative to the rest of the world. Thank God we have Canada. And one of the best alternatives right now to Russia and China is north of us. We'll have more on that part of the story in a second. So that's the news update part of today's video. Now I want to talk about today's sponsor, which is tied directly to this supply chain disruption and America's need for lithium. And that is Eureka Lithium Corporation. Now, if you're an investor, you better pay attention to what I'm about to show you. This is golden. Now, as we've already explained, the supply chain for lithium is under siege and it's about to be cut off from the West unless we can drill our own supplies and source our own lithium in North America. And that's exactly what Eureka Lithium is doing right now. Now, I think I found a jewel of a company that is barely a year old and it's under $20 million market cap right now. Right now, their stock is trading at just 39 cents a share. They're up 33% already this past month and no one even knows about this company but now you do, and they've done something that no other lithium company has done. They've discovered potentially one of the hottest lithium mining zones in the world. This is an incredible first mover advantage. Let me explain. If you've been watching my show for any length of time, you know all about the James Bay mining region in Quebec, Canada. It's a legendary spot. And for the last three years, James Bay has been the most prolific and important spot for mining lithium in all of North America. But it's all been bought up, meaning if you wanted to stake a claim there, good luck because nearly all of it has been claimed. No way, sorry, you're not building anything here. Everyone already got it. But what if you could turn back the clock on James Bay, take a time machine and invest in James Bay before the land rush? Like being able to buy Bitcoin at $40 a coin instead of what it is today at $43,000 a coin. Well, that's exactly what the company Eureka Lithium has done. So Eureka has discovered a zone that looks like the James Bay, but it's on steroids for lithium. Look at James Bay on your screen. See all the potential lithium in red there? Now look at the discovery they've made in northern Quebec called the Nunavik area. Notice the difference? Yeah, it's like twice as rich as the James Bay location and no one else knows about it. Eureka Lithium is the very first company to break ground in Nunavik. Now you might say, well, I'm not so sure that's a good, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And if I'm an investor, do I want to be following the company that got there first? Hmm, good question. Well, let me show you why I'm so bullish on this company. The largest single shareholder is this guy, Sean Ryan. 
Now, you might have seen his TED Talk. If you haven't seen his TED Talk, go and watch it. And he gave up everything to move to the Yukon. And he decides he wants to become the greatest prospector that ever, ever lived. He lived in like a tin shack with his wife. And he was using techniques and discovery methods that no one else was using. His discoveries are legendary in the gold industry. His gold discoveries are seriously off the charts amazing. He discovered amazing spots and then sold them for hundreds of millions of dollars. For 26 years, he did only gold. Now, he focuses on lithium. And he is the co-creator of this company, Eureka Lithium. He's the one who zeroed in on the Nunavik area as a lithium hotspot in northern Quebec and looks like it's double the amount that is found in James Bay. Now, if James Bay has produced billions in lithium, how much do you think this Nunavik zone is going to produce? Now, you might be saying, wait a second, how is this guy, Sean Ryan, the only one that's about to start drilling in Nunavik? Well, they're not. He created a land rush. Companies are now scrambling to buy up land after his discovery there. Cobalt Metals, a huge company that's leading in AI exploration for minerals just swooped in and also staked a claim to buy land. They are the second ones to arrive, and more companies are going to swoop in. So Eureka Lithium, though, is the first. And when the snow melts in the spring, the drilling begins. Literally the first company to drill in this hotspot. So talk about first mover advantage. And I always try to bring these companies to you before they start drilling, before they announce drilling results, because... You and I both know what happens usually after a company announces fantastic drilling results. Right now, the stock is trading at 39 cents a share as of this recording. It's up 33% and they haven't even started drilling yet. The demand for lithium in North America is off the charts. The West desperately needs lithium that is separate from China, Russia, and Iran. Guys, go and do your own due diligence on this company. Explore their projects. Study the Nunavik area. I also encourage you to go and watch Sean Ryan's TED Talk. It's inspiring. And if you want to buy a few shares of this stock, you'll need to use one of the larger brokerages like E-Trade or TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab. I personally use E-Trade for all of my smaller mining, uh, smaller cap mining stocks. Some of you have written me and say, I want to buy this company or that company. Where do I do it? You can't use like one of the smaller brokerages or the smaller uh, apps like a Robinhood or something, you need to use an actual brokerage, okay? So again, I'll have links to their stock ticker and their website in the description below. Go and do your own research and your own due diligence on this company, guys, and we'll see you next time.